supracondylar fractures of the humerus in children. Supracondylar fractures constitute approximately 50% of all elbow fractures. The supracondylar region is thin and weak and thus it can fracture easily. Fracture types. The fracture can be an extension type fracture as seen on the left or a flexion type fracture as seen on the right. The first type is an extension type fracture. This is the most common type. It occurs due to falling on an outstretched hand. In this type of fracture, the distal fragment displaces posteriorly. Anterior interosseous neuropraxia is the most common nerve palsy occurring with a supracondylar fracture. Injury to the anterior interosseous nerve will lead to weakness of the flexor digitorum profundus muscle to the index finger and the flexor pollicis longus muscle. The patient will not be able to do the OK sign with his hand or bend the tip of his index finger. Radial nerve neuropraxia is the second most common palsy and is evident by weakness in wrist and finger extension. The second type of fracture is a flexion type fracture which is rare and occurs due to falling directly on a flexed elbow. In this type of fracture the distal fragment is displaced anteriorly and may be accompanied with an ulnar nerve neuropraxia. Injury of the ulnar nerve will lead to loss of sensation along the little finger. Later on, the patient may also develop weakness of the intrinsic hand muscles and clawing. Gartland's classification for supracondylar elbow fractures. A Gartland type 1 fracture is a non-displaced fracture. A type 2 is angulated with an intact posterior cortex. A type 3 is a fracture showing complete displacement. A type 4 has complete periosteal disruption and shows instability in both flexion and extension. Plain AP and lateral x-ray should be obtained. A posterior fat pad sign seen on a lateral view x-ray should increase your suspicion of an occult fracture around the elbow. The anterior humeral line. On a lateral view x-ray, the anterior humeral line is drawn along the anterior border of the distal humerus. Normally, the anterior humeral line should run through the middle third of the capitulum. In extension type fractures, the capitulum will be displaced posteriorly relative to the anterior humeral line. Bauman's angle. Bauman's angle is formed by a line perpendicular to the axis of the humerus and a line going through the physis of the capitulum. Normally, Bauman's angle should measure at least 11 degrees. On examination, it is very important to assess the neurovascular structures. The anterior interosseous nerve is assessed by asking the patient to do the OK sign with his hand. The radial nerve is assessed by asking the patient to extend the wrist and fingers. The ulnar nerve is initially assessed by loss of sensation along the little finger. Later on, the patient may also have weakness of the intrinsic hand muscles and clawing. Non-operative treatment is usually indicated for type 1 fractures, and it usually consists of splinting or casting of the elbow for a duration of 3 to 4 weeks. It is very important to remember not to flex the elbow in a splint or cast beyond 90 degrees in order to avoid vascular compromise and compartment syndrome. Operative treatment is usually indicated for type 2 and 3 fractures and is done through closed reduction and percutaneous pinning. During reduction, pronation of the forearm during elbow flexion helps to correct a varus deformity. After reduction, check for a gap in the fracture. The neurovascular bundle may be trapped there. Free the brachialis muscle from the fracture site if it's into position there. 
Fixation of the fracture is usually achieved with two to three divergent lateral pins, depending on stability. Medial pins may also be added, depending on stability. Open reduction is indicated only when closed techniques are unable to achieve appropriate reduction of the fracture. Avoid posterior dissection to preserve vascularity of the fractured segment. Fracture reduction and fixation should be done emergently in cases of vascular compromise. Complications Neuropraxia is one of the complications that may occur, and it resolves by itself and is thus observed only. A cubitus varus deformity may occur due to malunion of the fracture. It only presents a cosmetic problem since it does not affect function. This deformity can be corrected later on by a supracondylar valgus osteotomy. Vascular problems such as compartment syndrome may occur. Folkman's ischemic contracture may also occur and is due to compression of the brachial artery when the patient is placed in a cast in hyperflexion, usually more than 90 degrees. Important scenarios. A patient may present with a displaced type 3 fracture and he has a pulseless hand. He may have adequate circulation, which is evident by normal temperature and color of the hand. Or he may have inadequate circulation, which is evident by a blue and cold hand. In both cases, urgent closed reduction and percutaneous pinning is required. After closed reduction and percutaneous pinning, if the circulation is adequate, observe the patient and place in a splint that is 45 degrees. However, if a patient continues to have inadequate circulation after closed reduction and percutaneous pinning, then the patient will require vascular exploration and repair. This video is for educational purposes only. Please consult your doctor before you make any decision about your medical care.